let's continue our verse by verse study through the book of Nehemiah. We're in chapter 5. So if you would turn, tap, scroll, let's get to Nehemiah chapter 5 together. Here's a thesis idea. Those who are in a right relationship with God will seek to be in a right relationship with others. They will do right towards others and seek to be right with others. Others. In other words, the evidence that you love God supremely is displayed because you love your neighbor as yourself. As you contemplate this idea, there's two Hebrew words that would be really relevant for us to understand this morning. The words are mispat and sadaka. Mispat and sadaka. They speak of righteousness or justice. Not justice in the sense of crime and punishment, but justice in the sense of doing what is right. For example, the prophet Micah, in Micah chapter 6, at verse 8, says words that might be familiar to many of you here. That God has shown humanity what he requires to do justice mispot, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The idea in a Judeo-Christian worldview is that as followers of God, as we see wrong in the world, that it is our duty affirmatively to seek to alleviate suffering, to alleviate injustice, to alleviate pain and hurt and need. That we cannot be indifferent, we cannot be apathetic, but we have an affirmative duty to do what is right. And in Nehemiah chapter 5 this morning, we're going to discover how to be right with God and others. I'm going to start reading the first five verses and ask you if you would to follow along silently. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren, for there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery And it is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and our vineyards. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would reveal to me and my friends here what you desire of us. How to be right with you and how to seek to be right and do right towards others. It is contrary to our nature, Lord. Reveal to us and make it a reality. For we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So the subject we're going to talk about this morning is Nehemiah's response to injustice. Nehemiah's response to injustice. And as you probably glean, the idea today is that we would be right with God and others. That we would be right with God and others. Now, real quickly, the context, if you haven't been with us, for nearly 150 years, the walls of Jerusalem had been in ruins since the Babylonian conquest. The people were in great distress, and God moves on the heart of Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem to lead God's people in restoring the walls. The restoration of the walls isn't the end in and of itself. Their spiritual reformation and restoration is the desired goal, and the walls being about the city and providing security are part of means to it. Now, I'll just give you a 10,000-foot level picture of this chapter. We're going to see great injustice that is being committed by God's people against one another. We're going to see Nehemiah confront that injustice, and then we're going to see a great reform that takes place, and we're going to see Nehemiah 
set in contrast to the great injustice. And so it might be really easy to look at this chapter and the whole arc of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and say the moral of the story is don't be a bad guy like the injustice people. Stop doing bad and be a good guy like Nehemiah. And if we walk away with that understanding, we will completely miss why this chapter is here which is how I'm teasing you to stay interested for the next 35 minutes. Because I think it's important for us to all to understand this. So first we see the problem of injustice. The problem of injustice. And here, the first thing is that God's people did not do right. God's people did not do right. So we see at verse 1 that there is a great outcry. We don't know if this outcry is towards Nehemiah or towards God, but I presume it is both. These people are crying out, and God is listening. In Exodus chapter 3 at the burning bush, God speaks to Moses and says, I have heard the cry of my people. They were suffering. They were oppressed as the taskmasters, as they were enslaved in Egypt. And they were crying out for God's intervention, for mercy. And God said to Moses, he has heard the cry of his people. He has seen their oppression. But here... The oppression wasn't at some foreign power, be it Egyptians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Romans. It's God's people committing injustice to God's people. The nature of the injustice is described beginning at verse 2. And here's the suffering that's going on. So first of all, you have people who are just poor. They don't own land and they can't afford food to eat. The second group of people have mortgaged their land because of now the famine that is taking place. To have enough food to eat, they've mortgaged the land. There's a third group of people that's described, and because they have to pay taxes to the Persian king, now they have to mortgage their property to their fellow Jews to pay the tax, and they have no way to pay back what they have borrowed against the interest that is being charged because it's not even their own land anymore since it's been mortgaged. And they're just working the land to try to make the interest payments and have no chance to repay. Now, the problem gets so dire, as it's explained in verses 4 and 5, that these people are having to sell their children into slavery because they have no means to pay back this debt. And just let that sink in for a moment. Um, First service people don't have teenagers, so you you can all feel this pain, right? (laughs) Some of you, like at the 11 o'clock service, some people are like, yeah, maybe that's a good idea, sell them into slavery. (laughs) You just think about how desperate this would be. Now, if we think of the word injustice, and and we hear that word used in our, our culture, and so injustice is a political issue, It is a social issue, but fundamentally, it is a biblical issue. When you think about issues such as racism, when you think about discrimination, when you think about violence, when you think about genocide, when you think about oppression, when you think about drug trafficking, when you think about sex trafficking, all of those injustices exist in our world today. Now, the irony, of course, is is that most of us, in hearing that, say, well, I'm not a drug trafficker, I'm not a sex trafficker, I don't commit violence, I haven't committed genocide, I haven't committed oppression, etc. So, therefore, I'm right with God, and I'm right with others, I am just. Perhaps. That'd be awesome. Maybe not. What we discover is that injustice continues until we are right with God and We are right towards others. So in Matthew 26 at verse 11, Jesus declares, the poor you have with you always. Until the Lord returns and restores his creation, there's going to be a need of people who are impoverished on this planet. It's not a lack of resources on the planet. It's the allocation of those resources and the problem of selfishness and greed. A wealthy young leader in the synagogue in Mark chapter 10 approaches Jesus. He's probably good looking, has a trophy bride, has a convertible chariot. The thing, just everything's going great for this guy. 
And despite having all of this, he approaches Jesus with the question, how do I experience life with God? I've got position, I've got prominence, I have wealth, I have everything, and yet I know there's something missing. And Jesus challenges him. He says, if you want to experience life with God, sell all your possessions, give all that resource to the poor, then you'll have treasure in heaven, and now come follow me. And the man walks away sorrowful. He's being confronted. Jesus doesn't challenge everyone to do that. This is the only one he challenged it. But he's now confronted looking at a mirror with the reality that he does not love God as much as he thinks he does. And he certainly doesn't love others as much as he thinks he does. And confronted with the reality that he loves his stuff more than he loves God, more than he loves his neighbors. It's quite the indictment. In James chapter 5, the half-brother of Jesus writes in the fifth chapter of his letter at the end of the New Testament, near the end, that the wealthy who are oppressing the poor need to stop. He confronts it. And the Apostle John, in writing his first letter, 1 John, in chapter 3, beginning at verse 17, he says, if you identify yourself as a follower of Christ... And you see someone who has need, and you don't do something about it. How can you say that the love of God is in you if you don't demonstrate that love in deed as well as in truth? Confronts us about the problem of injustice. Here, the proposed reform, uh, beginning at verse 6. Righteous anger. So Nehemiah says, And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. So Nehemiah, uh, the reason he left the palace in Persia, 900 miles away in Shushan, to come to Jerusalem was he was moved by his people's pain, their suffering, their trouble, their distress. And now when he hears how Jews are treating their fellow Jews, it says he became very angry, righteous indignation. Man, righteous indignation is something powerful in the Bible. For example, when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, he's carrying two stone tablets etched with the very finger of God with the Ten Commandments. And as he comes down, he hears the, the sound, and, and Joshua's assistant says, it sounds like a war party. And Moses says, that's not a war party. And he comes and he discovers these people worshiping a golden calf. And Moses is so angry that he takes the stone tablets etched with the very finger of God and throws them to the ground, cracking them, breaking those tablets. I, I just stop for a moment just... Put yourself in that situation. Like you are so upset that you have this letter written from God and you throw it down and it breaks. I don't know. That would be a wake-up call, I think. Be a wake-up call. Like, sorry, God. Um, but also, could you imagine this scene of these people worshiping this golden calf confronted by God's appointed leader and his righteous indignation? Wake-up call. Jesus, at the beginning of his earthly ministry in John chapter 2, he comes to worship at the temple, and he sees people buying and selling like it's a farmer's market or a flea market, and he takes these cords, and he binds them together like a whip, and he drives these people out. This is to be a house of prayer. This is to be a house of worship. You are disrespecting my father. Stop it. And then there were people who were engaged in currency exchange. So when you came to the temple annually for a feast, you paid a, a temple tax as an act of worship. But it could only be paid in the Hebrew shekel. So if you had Greek coins, if you had Roman coins, or any other realm, you would need to exchange it. And people were doing this currency exchange at an exorbitant rate. And Jesus turned the table over on the money changers. But his most indignant was the people who were selling animal sacrifices at a marked up price, especially those who sold doves or pigeons. 
If you were so poor that you couldn't afford a goat, let alone a lamb or an ox or a cow, you could offer to God all you could afford as an expression of your worship, your thanksgiving, a covering for the sin that you had committed. And so here's the people who are the poor. They're so poor, all they can afford is a pigeon. And their own people are exploiting them by charging an excessive price for the pigeon. And so Jesus, again, turns over the table on these people. And you can just imagine this scene. All the religious leaders now plot to kill him because he is upending everything that is going on in ritual Judaism and calling people to stop. It sounds awesome. Like, if you're thinking, like, yeah, pound that lectern, PB, go raise your voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. But here's the thing. Three years later, at the end of his ministry, he has to do the exact same thing. Righteous indignation will get people's attention, but it won't be sufficient. So, Nehemiah starts to think about this, and what he does next, he rebukes them. It says at verse 7, After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them, and I said to them, According to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now, indeed, will you even sell your brethren? Or should they be sold to us? They were silenced and found nothing to say. And then I said, What you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please, let us stop this usury. So, Nehemiah, I really respect this. At verse 7, he says he gave this some serious thought. In other words, um, I don't know about you, But sometimes when I'm angry, I tend to react rather than reflect and allow God's spirit to move. And so Nehemiah, it's really commendable. He he doesn't react in his anger. He starts to give this some thought. And then he calls the leaders together. And he says to them, he's challenging them. He rebukes them. It's a very strong disapproval that's being voiced here, starting at verse 7. He said, look, we were slaves in Babylon. We were enslaved to the Persians. Now 50,000 of us have come back into this land as free people. Are you going to enslave your brothers now? He says to them what they were doing was wrong. And the the specific charge of verse 7 and verse 10 is usury. So what is usury? Usury is charging an inappropriate interest rate on a loan. Usury is almost always immoral because it exploits people in their desperation. It is almost always immoral. Usury is also illegal. Almost every jurisdiction has laws that govern the interest rate that you can charge. And if you charge more than that interest rate, it is considered illegal. You start to think, this is, this is the stuff of the mafia. This is the stuff of payday loans. This is the stuff of exploiting people. And, and on its very face, it just reeks of exploitation. It just reeks of injustice. People are having to give their children to cover the interest and in the debt. This is sick, isn't it? But here's the thing. In the law of Moses, in the book of Exodus, the book of Leviticus, the book of Deuteronomy, so throughout the Mosaic law, God says repeatedly to his people, you can charge foreign people interest. You cannot charge an iota, a penny of interest against your own people. These are your people, and you live in community with them. You cannot charge them any interest. If they have a need and you have plenty, you give them, but you don't charge them interest. And you pay them back because it's the right thing to do. And so Nehemiah, 
he rebukes them. And it says in verse 9 that they were silent. They're convicted. They recognize what they're doing is wrong. And I love, I love when God's spirit is working in our hearts just to bring conviction. Conviction is not guilt. It's not shame. It's not beating people up. It's not telling you're not doing enough. It is just the reality of the word of God and the spirit of God enlightening us that we are misaligned with God's desire, with God's will. And it is that earnest desire to yield to his authority, to be right with God so that we can be right towards others. I was at a, a conference, oh gosh, like seven years ago, and I, I went um, to support a friend of mine, and, and that was the only reason I went, and it was talking about, uh, the purpose of this conference was talking about neighboring, the idea of actually engaging with your neighbors where you live, where you work, where you worship, where you study, where you play, and showing your neighbors the love of God. And this guy was speaking, and he was talking uh, about this idea of loving neighbors and talking about the great commandments. And it was almost as if God took a two-by-four and hit me right between the eyes. And I just realized that I don't even know my neighbors, let alone love my neighbors, let alone love my neighbors as I love myself. And I could try to justify it. I could talk about all the effort they made to love people, to love y'all. I could try to deny, deflect, justify, etc. Or I could stop and allow God to transform me, to do what he had called me to do, to be what he had called me to be. And so here, Nehemiah, he... he first of all, has this righteous anger. And then he reflects, cools down, and then he rebukes them. He expresses his strong disapproval of what they were doing. He, he's bringing this from the, this idea that it's below the radar to elevating this problem above the radar for them and a community to see. And then his third step in dealing with this is he proposes restoration. Look at verse 11. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and new oil that you have charged them. So they said, we will restore it, and we will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and I required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. And I shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And the assembly said, amen. And they praised the Lord and the people did according to this promise. Now, this is just mind blowing to me. So Nehemiah has got all these leaders, the, the wealthy people, and, and the whole assembly of all the people, and he confronts those who are exploited and says, okay, fine, you're silent as I make the, this rebuke of you, and this is what I'm charging you to do. I want you to give back everything, give back the land, give back the grain, give back the vineyards, give back the interest that you receive. Everything that you have taken, give it back. And these people, they say, we'll do it. Uh, that just blows my mind. And then Nehemiah, he knows the nature of people. He says, okay, let's bring the priests here, and you're going to make a solemn oath before God, and I'm going to call God to hold you accountable that if you don't do what you just promised to do, then God's going to judge you and just shake you out like I'm shaking out dust off my garment as he just dramatically drives home this point. And these people and being confronted, can you imagine like how much wealth had been transferred to these wealthy people and they recognized that they had gotten this gain at the suffering of others. And now they have all this accumulated wealth and Nehemiah is challenging them, and he says to them, give it all back, everything. And they're like, mm, going to have to think about this for a while. Let me pray about it, right? Something, it's, this just blows my mind. It's like, we'll do it. Okay, fine. I'm bringing the priests in so that you're making a solemn promise 
not only to these people, but to God. And there's consequences if you don't do what you're going to do. And they're like, yeah, amen, praise the Lord. All right, I have to think about this, man. My life doesn't work this way. Can you imagine if, if, if just on one hand, if I said to you, just as a community, those watching online, I said, look, there's just five things I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to regularly learn your Bible. I want you to regularly pray. I want you to regularly find a place where you can volunteer to serve God by serving others. I want you to regularly give some of your resource that God's given to you to advance God's kingdom. And I want you to respect the Sabbath. Just five just five. Didn't even have a list of 10, let alone 600 plus. Five. That you promised to engage in regular Bible learning, promised to engage in regular prayer, promised to regularly serve God by serving others, promisely, promised to regularly share your resources of time, talent, treasure, promised to respect the Sabbath. And I said to you guys, I want you to solemnly promise from this day forward that you're going to do that. That'd be pretty uncomfortable to do. It'd be pretty interesting. Because I, I imagine that there would be a certain social pressure. Because undoubtedly, somebody would say, yes, amen, count me in, Pastor. I don't know about these other people, but you know me. I'll do it already, so I'll just keep doing it. And then somebody else would feel that pressure and then someone else would stand up and someone would raise their hand and someone would shout amen and someone would say, praise the Lord. And in less than five minutes, presumably almost every single person in this room would affirm, yes, I am going to do those things, I promise. And you know something? It would be really interesting as a social experiment. It would be really interesting as an experiment in human behavior. And it would seemingly make my job much easier. Yeah, I mean, this would be great. Like, like, have one Sunday where I could do this, and like by next week, there would be that actual transformation, that actual reformation. How good would that be? Because in my world, nothing goes down like that except for doing laundry and the dishes. Everything else... There's like delayed response. And in one day, in less than five minutes, the great majority of us would all affirm that we're going to do those things. <sighs> At the risk of being a spoiler alert. As marvelous as this is, because it, it actually... They do everything they're said to. And, and so we could walk away from this story like, that was awesome! PB, why don't you make us promise like that? Because at the risk of a spoiler alert, we're going to keep turning chapters through this book, and what we're going to discover is all this reform was for naught. Because there's a moral here that we need more than moral reformation. What we need is spiritual transformation. Which now leads us to our third idea, the paradigm of justice. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions, but the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine, besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued the work of this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work, and at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox, six choice sheep, also fowl were prepared for me, and once every ten days, an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions, because the Bondage was heavy on this people. Verse 19. Remember me, my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. Now, again, at first blush, we would look at this as a 
story of morality. Here's these people committing this injustice. Here's the correction of the injustice. And here's Nehemiah as this positive role model. And we could walk away thinking the answer is, don't be an oppressor. Be a Nehemiah. He's a good guy. But I was going to suggest to you that as you contemplate the whole arc of the Bible's redemptive story, Nehemiah here is a picture of Jesus and his gospel. What we're seeing here are the characteristics of Jesus that we are to emulate as people who are in right relationship with God and seeking to be right towards others and to do right towards others. That's what we're going to see here. Nehemiah is not the hero of this story, and you're not the villain in this story. Jesus is the hero of this story, and all of us need to be transformed by Jesus and his gospel and the Holy Spirit and his word. Now, if you were to contemplate some of the characteristics of Jesus that show us that he is in right relationship with his father and does right towards others, if you were to think of that list of things that come to mind, I would imagine that many of us would have some divergence in our list, and that's well and good. Um, it is said by the Apostle John that all that Jesus said and did, even if all the books and all the libraries and all the world couldn't record all that Jesus did and said, that was exemplary. So I would say we could have some room for some divergence. But what I think you'll see here with me is a really good starting place where we can try to figure out, are we properly aligned with God and properly aligned towards others? Um, many of you know, this is just a quick divergence. Can I tell a quick story? Okay, so many of you knew that uh, I got hit by a car while riding my bike. My bike was made of steel, so instead of like a carbon bike that would just shatter, it bent. And so there was a bike mechanic who had the tools who could try to align my bike again so that it was rideable. It was lovely, and it's very dear and precious to me, but it wasn't completely True, it wasn't completely aligned. So that if I took my hands off the handlebars for just a second, it would turn left completely. And so I would ride this bike 80 to 100 miles a week, and it was constantly this tension there, such that my wheels actually became misaligned because of this tension. So I could tell that there was a problem with the bike, not because of how it felt, the wheels, the spokes, and the alignment were revealing that this was out of line. Similarly, if we look at this list that exemplifies Jesus as displayed through Nehemiah, and we contemplate this list, it will tell us whether we're aligned or not. The, 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 the point isn't you're bad, feel guilty, feel ashamed. It's simply to recognize there may be areas in our life where we need to get right with God because we're not right towards others. Now, I will encourage you guys before I even approach this list. I know so many of you in this room fairly well, as, as well as under the circumstances. There's a lot of right in this room. There is a lot of justice in this room as displayed on this list. But I'm not so naive that I don't want to look in the mirror and see where I need to change, where I need to be transformed. So let's contemplate this. First, self-sacrifice. So Nehemiah is appointed by the Persian king Artaxerxes to be governor of Judah. And so he reigned for 12 years, from the 20th year of Artaxerxes to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes. And as a result, he was supposed to have the governor's provision. And Nehemiah denies himself all of that provision. He, he could live very, very comfortably, but he recognizes that that puts a tax burden on his people that he doesn't want to put any burden on them at all. So he denies his own comfort. He denies his own pleasure. He sacrifices those things just like Jesus. 
It says in Philippians chapter 2 that, that Jesus is there in heaven enjoying all the privilege of his deity and he humbles himself and becomes man. He takes on humanity. He never stops being God. And then it says that he esteemed others better than himself. He put the needs of others better than himself. Self-sacrifice. A second characteristic that Nehemiah displays here is the right motive. It says at verse 15 that all these things that he did, he did because of the fear of God. Um, it's not that, that he's uh, fearing that God's going to you know, cast lightning bolts from heaven at him or throw down you know, hail the size of a boulder. It is reverence for God. And at verse 19, he says, remember me, O God, for the good that I have done. All that he is doing is motivated by love for God and love for others. Similarly, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 14, he said, let people see your good works. Let your light so shine that they see your good works and that they glorify your Father in heaven. Not for your glory, not for my glory, not for our affirmation, applause, or approval from fellow people, but for God's approval. In Matthew chapter 6, as he continued on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, hey, when you do your good deeds, do your good deeds without drawing attention to yourself. Your father sees everything that you're doing that's motivated with the right motive, and he's going to reward you openly. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, every good deed is going to be tested to see what the motive was. Were, were we motivated by love for God and love for others or some other motive? I, I confess, you know, uh, John the Baptist famously said of Jesus that he must increase and I must decrease. There was a time in my Christian life where I thought Jesus must increase and I can increase a little too. No. It's not about me. It never was. It never will be. It's always been about Jesus. And we have to be motivated rightly. Third, he served faithfully. At verse 16, this dude is the governor. Man, he's got plenty of labor around him. And this guy is building the wall at verse 16. Nehemiah himself is out there on the construction site. Doing the, the work. He didn't say, like, well, I'm the governor. That, that's beneath me. You people, you're the laborers. I, I'm, I'm a governor. I'm, I'll just sit in my ivory tower. He's out there taking out the trash. It's, it's epic. You think of Jesus in Mark chapter 10, of verse 44. He says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is Jesus is constantly serving others to the, to the point that he's just tired in his humanity. But it's his heart of service. Um, my father's name was Stanley, Stan. So I like to say the son of Stan did not come to be served, but to serve. Uh, this is what all of us should be about, is serving God by serving others. And then, fourth, generosity. So here is, is Nehemiah. He, he's providing food for people. 150 people are sitting at his table, leaders and uh, the lay people of Israel, as well as foreign dignitaries. Um, could you imagine just the expense of feeding 150 people regularly? And he, he's not imposing any tax burden on the people to underwrite the cost. He's just being generous. This isn't like, Nehemiah, yeah, he's awesome, be a Nehemiah. It's to look and say, this is a picture of Jesus. He is self-sacrificed. He is motivated solely for the glory of God, not any of his own glory. He serves rather than seeking to be served, and he is generous. The most generous thing God could possibly do is give us Jesus and his gospel, and Jesus voluntarily gives his life so that we could be restored with God. Now, I, I wish I could tell you that this is just about moral reformation, that we could just be better people, if we could just get, make a little progress, be a little better, then the world's going to be a better place. And there's value in, in reformation, undoubtedly. All these people getting their land back, that's pretty significant. The problem is, until you get right with God, 
until the Holy Spirit gives you spiritual birth, until you begin to understand what God values, what God says is right or wrong, you cannot begin to be right with others. And the way you'll know that you're right with God is because you're seeking to be right with others. Because you're seeking to be more like Jesus. That is the message of Nehemiah chapter 5. This is the answer to injustice. In, in whatever way you are called to do right, it is reducing injustice globally. Just do your part. Let's pray. Father, I pray for anyone here today who hasn't yet received you, hasn't received a spiritual life, that this would be the day that they would recognize their need for a Savior. That more than moral reformation, what we need is spiritual transformation. And only you can reconcile us to the Father. If that's you right now, there's no special prayer that you have to say. You don't have to stand up and come down the aisle. Right there in the quiet of your seat, you can let God know that you're ready. And for the many of us, Lord, who have already made that decision, I thank you for your gentle correction. I thank you for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We confess to you, Lord, that sometimes we are selfish and greedy, that we are apathetic towards the needs of others. We want to be more like you. We, we thank you for the life that you've given us. We pray that we would not squander. Help us to do justly. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.